Welcome back to our study in the book of Joshua. We uh, jumped in to chapter 6 in our last lesson, and today we'll be finishing it up. But I have a lot of special, I call them yummies to my class, treats, and uh, some extra sidebar things that I think that I think will be of great interest to you today. I end the first uh, part of chapter 6, um, which we've entitled, entitled Sound and Shout. Um, of course, it's they were very quiet as they walked around uh, Jericho and didn't, didn't make a sound except what their feet were walking on. And then on the seventh day, they walked around the cities. Uh, and, uh, and at the end, sh several times and shouted uh, a great shout. And the walls fell down and could just collapsed. And so I'm already excited and trying to grasp for the correct words as I'm in my mind visualizing what happened on that final day. Uh, just an amazing thing. All right, we have looked, uh, verses 1 through 7 was the strategy. The strategy was that the Lord told Joshua exactly what to do. And what the Lord said had to be done exactly as he said. Um, Joshua conveyed that to the just down the leadership line and made sure that everything was in order. And then not only do we have it just spoken once, we have the strategy rehearsed over uh, a few times so that you get it right. And then the sequence is them pulling it off and them doing it and them doing it right and them honoring and uh, doing exactly what God says. Uh, people would look at, say, Joshua is a great general. And as we examine this, we would say our God is a greater God um, because he, what he promised, he did. Uh, it's us that fails when God makes us a promise that we leave things out, do things our way. All right, when we get into uh, verse 22 through 27, uh, that wraps the chapter up. That's the sequel. So I wanted to go back and share with you the map. We're looking at the central campaign. Um, we are at Jericho. Next stop will be AI, and that's in the next chapter. <clears throat> and so that's the little green broken lines. And then Joshua goes into the southern campaign, and that's a couple weeks down the line before we even get there. Last week, I closed with showing uh, Jericho, the ruins, the archaeological digs that have gone on. The, just, and it's basically just a big heap of rubble. They've dug, they've dug up rooms and things like that or, and put them back together uh, within the heart of the city. But they, it's just a big pile of, of dirt and gravel uh, today. Very, very hard. And what I wanted to share with you today is I wanted to, to have us take a look around the area, around Jericho. What's going on? Because a lot in the Bible happened around that big pile after God gave this great victory. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the word the Jericho Road, um, but the Jericho Road was the travel route from Jericho back up to Jerusalem. And this would be done on foot straight up through the mountains and some of the passages, passageways and the very small valleys. Uh, people from this elevation are below sea level at Jericho and they climb high. They climb about 3,000 feet. They have to ascend that in this journey. And so with my arrows, I don't, I believe that you can see to the right of the far left arrow. Uh, you can see the path starting up the hill, and then it veers over to the right where that middle arrow is, crosses there, and then it just sort of winds back behind that hill and then comes back again and goes up and around at the upper right-hand portion of the picture. And you're on your way to the Jericho Road. Um, the people in Jericho, when they lived there and the city was there, that was there. It was a travel route. It was a foot route. 
and it was the shortest way uh, to get to some of the inner country cities. Here is a, a good picture of it, and you can see Jericho way on the upper part of our picture, uh, and the map, see the Dead Sea to the far right, and these are just sort of the stops and the travel routes as it would wind through uh, the, the, the Judean mountains, and they are ascending up from the Dead Sea level. So one of the pictures, you could walk it today if you want. Uh, we were there. I did not want to walk it, nor I did, nor did I. Along the Jericho Road, something's very famous. It's called the End of the Great Samaritan, um, and I think you know the story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus talked about. See, Jesus walked this route. The, what you just saw those people walking on, Jesus walked there and his disciples. And Jesus would come this way and he told the story of, of the man that was, a thief grabbed him and beat him and left him for dead and stole all his money. And it was a Samaritan that ultimately stopped by and helped him and bring him back to this inn. We also know that back into Jericho, and do you, can you see the big pile, uh, the big mound there? It's, that's Jericho, that's what's left of it. Um, as you go towards the, uh, as you go towards the river and are going, that you're facing west, as you come back and go back east, um, there is what is called Elisha's well and his springs. And Elisha came down through this during Bible times, down into the, the, the ruins of this city. They were building, they would build things. They had a new city of Jericho going where people lived, but not here, just down the way a little bit, uh, several hundred yards. And people would li build, rebuild their houses here and there. It didn't make a city, but they did have the well and they did need the water. But what happened was that the waters became very, very bitter, and they could not be they they could not drink them any longer. And Elisha comes through here, and the Bible says that he that he purified the waters, and that he changed them and made them pure and fresh. And when we were there, our guide uh, took us over by there, and there was a man that lived in the area. And he was getting water. It was good drinking water. Um, he offered it to us, but we did not take it. As you know, the old adage, don't drink the water. And so we tried not to. Here's more of that picture. So what else happened at Jericho? And I'll do it quickly because we need to get into our lesson. Jer Jericho was used as a sort of an outpost. The ruins, uh, because it was a big hill, by Eglon. He was the king of Moab in Judges 3. Uh, this area was where there was a school for the prophets nearby in 2 Kings chapter 2. Uh, the the uh, Le Levite, the, the, the prophets were trained there in scripture and, and in how to be a prophet, how to pray, how to, how to lead. Elisha purified the springs. We mentioned that Jesus heals two blind men on the outskirts of Jericho. Jesus uh, dined, remember Zacchaeus up in the tree? Uh, he called him down and Zacchaeus invited him for dinner and Jesus went. And uh, we know that the New Testament Jericho was built by Herod, but it was more than a mile away. And he did that as sort of an outpost also, a place to flee from Jerusalem in case enemies came to try to get him. All right, let's get into our verses because this is, we're, we're going to be dealing with Rahab and looking at her. Um, because remember, her and her family, that's the one portion of the wall that did not fall. So let's read, and here we go. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, Rahab, and bring out thence the woman and all that she has as you swore unto her. So the two men that were the spies, he went back because they went 
into the room because they would be recognized. They went back to Rahab's portion where the wall was, knowing they wouldn't be attacked, nor would they attack. And you remember the, the cord? Uh, it would still be there. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And so they let them set up camp, but outside the actual camp. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and gold and the vessels of brass and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. So once they cleared Rahab and her family, they finished burning, they just burnt the city. They took, they, this is what they took. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive in her father's household and all that she had. And she dwells in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. That's, that's just amazing that she was incorporated into the family. And so I did a little bit of study of what happened to Rahab, um, knowing that she was, she was engrafted into this new nation and into Israel, what happened to her along the way. And so that's my first statement that I, I wrote here because of just that's what the Bible said and where we are. Rahab and her, Rahab and her family were engrafted into a new, a new nation. Keep in mind what her occupation was. She wasn't married. She was a harlot. Nobody wanted her. And so down the road, we read that she became the wife of a man, an Israelite by the name of Solomon. Uh, we read that in 1 Chronicles 2, verses 10 and 11, and Ruth. And then there's an account of her in Matthew and in Luke. Um, I want us to read, and I want you to see what happens to her in, in this sense and what happens to her line because she has children. Here's the 1 Chronicles account. And Ram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nah. Nashon, prince of the children of Judah. And Nashon, this is the tribe of Judah, begot Salma, and Salma begot Boaz. Salma is Salmon. Uh, that is his name. Let's go to Ruth. And Abinadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. There he is. And Salma begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed. Hmm. Some of these names here, Salmon and Rahab, gave birth to a baby they named Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed. Let's go to the New Testament. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And as you go down through there, Abraham begot Isaac and Jacob and uh and Jacob begot Judas and his brethren, and Judas begot Pharaoh, and down through the line we go. And look at verse 4. And Aram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nasan, that's the, the same man. And Nasan begot Salmon. And Salmon begot Boaz of Rachab, that's where he lived. And Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. And Obed begot Jesse. And do you know who Jesse's son was? It was David. And so Rahab is, is one of the great-grandmothers of, of King David. She is in, she and her ancestors are in the line of Jesus Christ. And so here's a woman, a, a Gentile that was saved, at a, a harlot that came obviously to know the Lord, and was engrafted into the, the, actually the bloodline of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that is just utterly amazing. Let's continue on. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and builds his city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation there of in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. It's interesting that, that Joshua is pronouncing a curse 
that the Lord would curse anybody that would try to rebuild this city on that foundation. And he said the the dad would lay the foundation and die. And then his youngest son, and uh, or rather his firstborn would lay the foundation, sorry, and die. And his youngest son would pick up where he left off because, he, because he's younger and had some more years. Then he would, the, the gates, he'd get the gates up, but these guys would be cursed. And this came true. Um, this happened 550 years. The curse was obviously forgotten. And when the oldest son got lay, tried to lay the foundation and did at Jericho, he died. The only surviving child, the youngest one, when he put the, gate, the gates up, put the first ones up to start the wall, they were done, he dies. And guess what? Nobody picked up on it. Nobody finished off the city. Those things that, that they did just collapsed and were left alone. And we can go look at where, where the Jericho, the Joshua, and the children of Israel with, with the Lord's leadership and God's blessing completely destroyed the city. And Ahab, uh, this is reading the story here, and Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God. This is King Ahab, worst king in Israel's history, of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that before him. And in his day did Hiel, the Bethelite, build Jericho. This is the guy's name. He laid the foundation thereof, and Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof, and his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. This is, this is, the, two, this is the family that tried to pull this off, and it didn't go. Then verse 27, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noise throughout all the country. That's the last verse of our study, but it's not. The word fame here means fame or can be translated out of the Hebrew as renown or the, the rumors spread, but the rumors were truth. And so the rumors didn't stay rumors long, but the fame of Joshua just went out. And it would be a blessing to God's people, but it would be a terror to the people in the country because the Israelites were just starting. Now I have one more verse to share with you before we close off. Hebrews 11.30, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Notice what it took. We're in Hebrews 11, which is God's Hall of Fame or the, the Walk of Faith. And there's a large list of people all throughout the Bible that accomplished and did incredible things, endured in, even in their death, didn't waver in their faith in the Lord. And it says, by faith, God's people, Je Joshua, the, the people under him, the entire nation, believed because God said that it would happen, and it did. And God blesses faith. God blesses just pure faith. The, the word of God is full of promises. When you run across them and God gives a command and says, if you do this, I'll do this, do it. Do it by faith, knowing that God will bless you. And there are so many wonderful things. You know, we are saved by faith. For for. By grace are you saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our salvation is faith. We just trust God and he saves us. There's wonderful, great things. So I have a takeaway with you that I'm going to leave. I've had this list, uh, for ran across this a long time ago, and uh, I'm getting some help uh, by a from John Maxwell. He has a lot of leadership books out, and I like leadership and I study leadership. Um, I have a lot of different sources, but that's one of them. And I 
have, give him credit for this, and I've dropped 10 things uh, that he had in this list in the first 20 verses of Joshua 6, and he entitled it, Joshua Practices the Law of Victory. I love it. And I just want to close and just read these through, let them sink through to you, and then may I encourage you to go back and put these 10 things back into those 20 verses and just see how it is, but apply it to our lives. And so number one says he made obedience his first priority. Joshua, God said something, God told Joshua to do this this way. So the priority isn't when to win the battle, the priority is to obey God. Two, he never waited to see what the crowd wanted to do. I don't ever read anybody voting on this or him bouncing it off of anybody to see what they thought. He just knew God said it, let's go. He made decisions from an eternal perspective, not a temporal one. Joshua saw far beyond just a victory over Jericho. There was a whole lot more land that had to be conquered. And this was just step one. And you know, trust God for step one, but see beyond it. You need to see beyond the walls of your church. You need to see beyond the whatever it, whatever it is you are doing. You can't get boxed into, into today. Look to tomorrow and look to the future. Someone once said, uh, plan your life like Jesus is not coming for a thousand years, but live it as if he's coming today. And that puts things in perspective. Four, he acted decisively. He, he didn't waver. Five, he deeply appreciated the past without worshiping it. He thanked the Lord. I mean, he had a lot to thank God for in the past and what God had done. He valued results more than image and reputation. He didn't care what people thought about him. But God said, I will, I will make you as great in the eyes of your people as Moses, if not more. And so he just said, oh, okay. He believed God, but he went after the results. He knew that to influence others, he had to stand up and be counted. He never wavered from his understanding of what was right. He did exactly what God wanted him to do. He trusted his God more than his gift. And I'll use his gift of leadership and his military skills. But whatever your gift is, don't trust in the gift. Trust in God who gave you the gift. And he made glorifying God his ultimate objective. Most important thing to him was to bring glory and praise to God. And so that's why the last verse of the chapter ended. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was noised throughout all the country. And the story of Joshua and the children of Israel and their walk with God and the battles that they will fight are just beginning. Father, thank you so much for this chapter and the example of this man and his people and this nation. They're going to they're gonna fall. They're going to have some problems ahead. We're going to see them. But we see, we see the result of confession. And we see forgiveness. And we see that you, your hand is not removed from them, but strengthened in their lives. So teach us as we go through this book. May the principles of Scripture move us and challenge us and change us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you all.